Oh, hey there. Ready to get mad? Hello, beautiful best friends. Hi, how are you going? It's so nice to see your gorgeous faces again. Thank you so much for joining me back here in our safe, cozy space of the big, scary internet. I hope life has been treating you super well and that you're having a fantastic week so far. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Liz and I am so happy that you randomly stumbled across this video. Please consider this your official heads up that we are not alone today, not in that weird ex files the truth is out there kind of way but more in a we are joined by my big awkward lovely guest star Lily kind of way because she is just a teensy bit codependent and freaks out if I lock her out while I'm trying to record. So I'm sorry for any noise disturbances you might hear in the background today but you are so welcome for any emotional support breaks that Lily deems to grace us with today when things get too intense because she is an angel and likes watching out for us. Right, Lily? Yes, you are an angel, aren't you? <gasps> what was that? Is that thunder? Did you hear that? So today we're talking about a case that I guess has a few elements to it, maybe more than a few that you could consider cliche. Like I'll be honest, my introduction to this case was one of those really bad crime shows with the cringy soap opera style dramatizations with the intense close-ups of the actors' faces. You, you know the ones. And I get it because at first glance, this case ticks all of the boxes needed for it to be over sensationalized. But I wanted to start off this video with an apology for giving that show any time of day because after researching and learning a little bit more about the victim, I just got so mad because they deserved so much more and to have their story told in a much more respectful way. So that's the aim today. And just be prepared to be also so mad right along with me because this is definitely a case that will get your blood boiling. And with all of that said, we are going to begin by going back in time to 1998 to a small waterfront town called St. Michael's on the shore of Maryland. At the time, and probably still today, I guess St. Michael's was a very popular holiday spot. It has great views of the Miles River and the Chesapeake Bay, and it was a place where people from the Baltimore area would go just to get away from the stress and bustle of their everyday lives and to slow down and relax and you don't find their zen. And that is exactly what 35-year-old Stephen Rico and his 32-year-old wife, Kimberly Rico, had in mind when they checked into the Harbortown Golf Resort in St. Michael's at 3 p.m. on Saturday the 14th of February, all geared up for a romantic Valentine's Day weekend away together to unwind and reconnect. Steve had booked them in for one of the resort's $239 Valentine's Day special deals that they were offering, and so upon arrival, he and Kim were presented with a bottle of champagne at reception before they made their way to their beautiful waterfront cottage to get all settled in for the weekend ahead. And part of this package deal was actually a murder mystery theater dinner party. If you're unfamiliar with the concept of one of these events, basically the company running the event will employ actors who will take on the roles of characters in a whodunit style murder mystery. And it's kind of like a play, but also kind of not because during the night the audience will interact with the actors learning all about the different dynamics in the group and the idea is that it becomes fairly obvious early on if there's any conflict going on between the characters that might potentially lead to murder and then at some point during the night someone does get murdered and it's the audience's job to figure out who the killer was using clues and asking the actors questions and all of that kind of thing. Honestly although I am familiar with the concept of these nights, um, usually the idea of any event that relies on audience participation is just not my idea of a good time. You know, even when you're sitting there watching someone give a presentation or a speech and they prompt the crowd for feedback and then no matter what that feedback is, they're like, 
come on guys, you can do better than that. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't like that. Like I just want to quietly pull them aside and say, yeah, so I, I'm pretty sure I did my part just by showing up today. Like, let's be real. Only one of us signed up to amp up this crowd today and it wasn't me, but I mean, you're doing great. Just please let's not do that again. But I would be so down for one of these nights. Like it sounds like so much fun and I would probably totally geek out. But Steve, on the other hand, as a quiet, reserved kind of guy, this was definitely not his idea of a good time, but he had booked it in anyway because he knew that it was right up Kim's alley and that she was going to love it. So at 7 p.m., Steve and Kim made their way to the conference room where the dinner production was being held that night. And this particular show was called The the bride who cried and the whole premise was that the dinner guests from the resort were actually guests at this big faux mafia wedding reception where when the groom gets up to give his speech and toast his new bride he falls over dead because his champagne has been poisoned I know it all sounds super dramatic and super fun um, spoiler alert if you are interested it wasn't the bride that poisoned him it was her mother but anyway back Back to Steve and Kim. Steve had been 100% right. Kim was so into this whole thing. She was so into the mystery and being quite a bubbly and outgoing person, she was mingling with the actors before dinner even started, trying to gather information about who might have had beef with who. And people later said that she was among the most vocal that night with her speculations and guesses. Later, once the mystery had been solved and the guests had all chatted and debriefed a little while, Steve and Kim left the event somewhere between 10 and 10.30 p.m. to return to their cottage to retire for the night, having had a fabulous time. Well, at least Kim did. I'm pretty sure Steve just grinned and bed the whole evening just to be a good sport for Kim. And it would be roughly just three hours later that Kim would return to hotel reception and alert the staff that there was a fire in her room and that her husband, Steve, might still be inside. Upon hearing this, a couple of the hotel staff quickly rushed to the cottage where they were met with a smoke-filled room. And when one of them looked inside through the glass sliding door at the rear of the cottage, sure enough, he could see a pair of feet, obviously belonging to a man, lying on the floor between the two twin beds in the room. So braving the remaining flames, these guys quickly got inside and dragged Steve out. But even as they were carrying him, it was clear from the horrific burns all over Steve's upper body and his head that it was too late. And at about 2 a.m., once police and firefighters and paramedics had all arrived, Steve Rico was pronounced dead on the scene. But while it was initially believed that Steve had died as a result of a terrible accident, it would be just two weeks later that Kimberly Rico herself would be arrested and charged for arson and the first degree murder of her husband, Steve Rico. And I know this is different for us. Like, usually I don't tell you guys so early on who the killer was, but Knowing what I do about this case and also about Kim, I think it's just very appropriate for all of us to be collectively angry at Kim as a group for the next 30 to 40 minutes. Like it's only fair and you guys will see what I mean as we go on. But before we go any further, let's back it up a little bit and learn a little bit more about Steve and Kim. So Steve was born on the 22nd of November, 1962. He was one of four siblings born to his parents, Michael and Mary Rico. And growing up during his school years, Steve had been a standout gifted footballer, thanks in part to his his towering height of 6'4 and his very solid frame. But despite his large size and strength, Steve was definitely known as a gentle giant by his family and friends. He was described as shy and reserved. And although he was a really lovely guy, he tended to keep quite a small friend group. In fact, throughout his whole life, he had had the same best friend since seventh grade, Mike Miller. And it was during Steve and Mike's college years that Mike's girlfriend, Maureen, met Kim when they were waitressing together at the same restaurant. And Maureen thought that Steve and Kim would make a great match. So one night in 1984, Mike and Maureen and Steve and Kim all went on this big double date together. And whereas Steve was quiet and reserved, Kim was quite the yin to his yang. She was very vivacious and bubbly. She also did advocacy work for abused children. And 
according to Steve's friends from that very first night, he was just instantly head over heels in love. Like they just instantly clicked and they went on to date for about five years before getting hitched in 1989. And then one year later, they welcomed their daughter, Anna, into the world. So skipping forward through the years, by 1998, the year that Steve died, Steve and Kim had been married for nearly 10 years. Their daughter Anna was nearly nine years old and the family were living in a town called Laurel in Maryland where Steve worked as a superintendent of groundskeeping at the Baltimore Country Club Golf Course and Kim worked as a certified surgical technician at Holy Cross Hospital. Steve's friends said that he was a huge family man and that Kim and Anna were the two most important things in his life. But while Steve and Kim's marriage had started out amazing, by now they had been married nearly a decade. And as is the case with majority of marriages, it had definitely not been smooth sailing all of that time. And there were definitely some cracks that were starting to show. And so the couple had recently decided together to start marriage counseling. And Kim said that both she and Steve hoped that this romantic Valentine's weekend getaway would be just what they needed to disconnect from the stresses of day-to-day life and to reconnect with each other. But as we know, the weekend would instead end in tragedy. Back to the scene of the fire, by the time firefighters and police had arrived, the fire had already burned itself out because the room was that well insulated that there hadn't been enough oxygen for it to continue spreading. And investigators found the damage to the room itself to be relatively minimal. I mean, the mattress and the bed and headboard had all been burned nearly right through, but the rest of the room was pretty undamaged. And as first responders were rifling through the wreckage for pointers as to what had started the blaze, Kim was speaking with police, and this is what she had to tell them about the events leading up to the fire itself. So Kim basically said that from the moment they had arrived at the resort that afternoon, Steve had been drinking heavily, starting with the bottle of champagne that they had been given upon check-in, and then continuing at the dinner with Steve down large amounts of both beer and wine throughout the night. Then Kim said that when they left that night, they had also purchased a full pack of beer at the hotel bar before they went back to their room and Steve continued drinking as they sat together watching a movie on the bed. And basically by this point, Steve was very heavily intoxicated or to put it as Kim did, Steve was sloppy drunk. And Kim said that it was while Steve was in this intoxicated state that he began pouring at her and pressuring her for sex, which she wanted not one bar of, not just because he was drunk, but because before this weekend, they had made a pact that they would not have sex on this getaway. And so Kim said that she had rejected all of Steve's advances and the whole thing had turned into this big heated argument that essentially ended with her fleeing the cottage, getting into her car and driving into the night intending to visit her and Steve's friends, Mike and Maureen Miller. You remember Steve's best friend from seventh grade and his wife. Yeah, they were all still really close and Mike and Maureen lived really close to the resort. But Kim said that she had gotten lost on the way to Mike and Maureen's house. And so eventually she had turned around and driven back to the resort. And when she got there, she realized she had forgotten her room key. And so she went around to the back of the cottage to try and get through the glass sliding door to see if it was unlocked. And that's when she realized that the room was engulfed in flames and called 911 before alerting staff at reception. And all of this was really lining up perfectly with what police were finding in the charred remains of the fire. There was the empty champagne bottle in the trash, as well as an assortment of empty and partially filled beer bottles scattered around. And also Steve's body had been found in what I guess would be considered a compromising position. Essentially, Steve had been found with a Playboy magazine down by his side on the floor and his pajama bottoms had been pulled down around his knees. And so when the point of origin of the fire was narrowed down to the two pillows that he had been laying his head on and a pack of cigars with one missing from the pack was found near the bed, investigators had a pretty clear idea formed as to what had caused the blaze. The initial assumption was that Steve, blind drunk and pissed off that his wife had turned him down for sex on this romantic weekend getaway, he had turned to his Playboy magazine and lit up a cigar and then promptly passed out, dropping the lit cigar and inadvertently starting the fire that caused his own death. So a tragic but unfortunately not all that uncommon routine smoker's accidental death. 
However, when the fire marshal returned to the scene the following day just to kind of tie up any loose ends and close the case and file it away off his desk, he pretty much immediately found things that had him second-guessing this whole scenario. First off, he wanted to eliminate any other sources that could have started the fire. And so he went over the electrics in the room, over the air conditioning and heating units, and he confirmed that there were no lightning strikes, like freak lightning bolts that could have sparked the blaze that night, like just going through the list and striking things off. And during this, he did note that there was a log fire in the room and that the log in this fire wasn't meant for the commercial setting that it was in, but it didn't matter because the log fire was way too far away from the point of origin, the pillows that had been under Steve's head to be the source of the fire. And so he ruled out all of those possibilities, but obviously, thank God, he still felt like something was a little bit off. And so with all of his spidey senses tingling, he took the next step and brought in a very good boy, a black Labrador named Bear, who was trained to detect flammable liquids. And Bear did the best job ever and alerted the fire marshal that yes, right at the point of origin between the two beds, he detected the scent of an accelerant. Meaning of course that this fire hadn't been an accident at all. It had been lit intentionally. And so on the case file, the cause of fire was immediately changed to arson. Oh, hi. Did you hear me talking about another doggy? Yeah, he was a good boy named Bear. He did such a good job. It's okay. You're the best dog. Then the results from Steve's autopsy came in and they were just as shocking because not only did Steve's carbon monoxide levels come back completely normal, but there was no soot found in his nose, mouth, trachea or lungs, which meant that Steve hadn't breathed in any smoke at all before he died. So either Steve was already dead before the fire started or at the very least, he was already not breathing by that point. Also, despite what Kim had said about Steve being drinking all day and into the night, Steve's blood alcohol level had come back at 0.00. Speaking of Kim, at the scene of the fire, even then, she had sent some eyebrows raising from very early on. Firstly, investigators were having trouble understanding what exactly was going on in the two hour period between the time when Kim said she had left the resort to visit Mike and Maureen after the argument and the time that she said she had returned to find the cottage on fire because Mike and Maureen lived just a 10 to 15 minute drive away from the resort and Kim was saying that she had gotten lost for two hours trying to find their house. Personally, if I didn't know what I did about this case, I could probably believe that maybe Kim had driven around for a couple of hours to clear her head after the fight with Steve. Like that would make way more sense to me, but that isn't what Kim was saying. She claimed that she had had stopped and asked multiple people for directions that she couldn't even find her way onto the highway and she kept trying all of this time to find the house until eventually she gave back and headed back to the resort. The thing was though Kim had her mobile phone on her and police knew that it was charged and functioning properly because she had used it to call 911 to report the fire and they knew that she knew the Miller's phone number off by heart because she had rattled it off to an officer on the scene asking them to call Mike and Maureen for her. Leading police to ask the obvious question when Kim realized she was lost, why didn't she just call the Millers and ask for directions rather than driving around blindly for two entire hours? And Kim's response was that she didn't want to wake the Millers up. You know, before she rocked up unannounced to their house and woke them up. Kim also told police that when she had gotten to this sliding door and seen the flames, she had run along banging on the doors of the cottages close by asking for help, but no one had answered. So she had rushed to her car and sped to reception to tell the hotel staff calling 911 on the way. But when police spoke with the guests and hotel staff in question, it was a completely different story. The guests in the neighboring cottages said that they had never heard Kim banging on their door 
doors or shouting for help. Instead, they said that they had only been awakened when the hotel staff had come to their rooms to evacuate them after the alarm had already been raised. And the hotel staff at the reception desk, when police asked them about this mad, frantic rush that Kim had described in trying to alert them about the fire, they were like, uh... No, it wasn't like that at all. They said that Kim had calmly pulled up to reception, taking the time to turn off her engine and headlights before walking in and casually informing them that her room was possibly on fire. And it wasn't until they asked her if there was anyone else in the room that she was like, oh, oh yeah, um, my husband might be in there. And then while police had spoken with Kim for the first time at about 2.30 a.m., so roughly one hour after Steve's body had been recovered from the cottage, when they then went to go and speak with her again a few hours later at 5 a.m. that morning, they had had to wake her up because while they had been busy processing the scene, Kim had been busy taking a nap in a different room that the resort had kindly set her up in. Yes, you did hear me correctly. Just a few hours after her husband died, Kim was catching some Z's. Like, I just don't know how much more clearly she could have hammered home how not torn up she was about her husband's death. But by now, I'm sure a lot of you guys are sat there with a lot of questions about how and why Kim did this. So let's hash it out, starting with the why. So it turns out that Kim and Steve's marriage was in way worse condition than what Kim had originally let on. I know, shocking, right? In actuality, things were that bad that Kim had asked for a divorce back in November 1997, so roughly three or four months earlier. And this had absolutely devastated Steve. He had broken down and begged and pleaded for Kim to stay and to work things out. And she had grudgingly agreed. And this was when the couple had decided to start marriage counseling. And Steve had also started taking antidepressants around this point because he found himself so disheartened about the state that he felt like he had let his marriage dip to. And Kim had given Steve essentially this list of things that he needed to work on. She said that she was sick of him not helping out around the house. She was sick of him being a homebody and not wanting to go out and do things with her. He didn't spend enough time with her and Anna and so on and so on. So Steve determined to do whatever it took to save this marriage. He was diligently working on on all of these things to improve himself and his relationship with Kim. For Kim, on the other hand, this was all apparently too little too late. Like she had already closed that door and no matter what, there was nothing that Steve could do that was going to fix things. In fact, it made it worse. Like she told one friend that Steve was being way more attentive and present. He was sending her these beautiful love letters. She was even getting random phone calls from him during the day where Steve just wanted to say hi and tell her that he loved her, something that he would never usually do. But Kim told this friend that all of this affection from Steve was making her feel sick and she felt like he was stifling her. But apart from feeling stifled, there was yet another reason that Kim was not interested in mending her marriage with Steve. Yes, she was having an affair. Because of course she was, right? So in November 1997, coincidentally, the very same month that Kim had asked Steve for a divorce, Kim was a maid of honor for a close friend of hers from work named Jennifer. And it was during all of the pre-wedding festivities that Kim met Jennifer's cousin, Brad Winkler, and learned that he was going to be house-sitting for the bride and groom while they were away on their honeymoon. And Kim was immediately impressed by Brad. Brad was a 23-year-old Marine assigned to the Pentagon, and obviously, despite Brad being fully aware that Kim was married, the two of them just hit it off very quickly. And poor Jennifer, Kim's friend, while she was away on her honeymoon with her brand new husband, Kim just could not stop calling her, saying that she was about to start an affair with her cousin, Brad. Like, can you imagine being newly married and your maid of honor calling you on your honeymoon to brag that she was about to start an affair with your cousin? I know, Lily. What the heck? Can you believe that? Can you believe it? I can't believe it either. Poor Jennifer, hey? 
Yes. What kind of maid of honor does that though? And then the second Jennifer got back, rather than Kim being all like, oh my God, tell me all about how dreamy your honeymoon was. Give me all of the deets. No, all Kim wanted to talk about was how while Jennifer and her new husband had been away on their honeymoon and Brad had been house sitting for them, Kim and Brad had been shacking up whenever they could in their home. And this affair between Kim and Brad was still going on months later when Kim and Steve went on their Valentine's Day getaway, which Steve had arranged under the impression that both he and Kim were on board to save their marriage. If only Steve had known that the night before they left, Kim had visited Brad's house while he was assigned out of town on duty to leave him a bunch of Valentine's Day presents and a card in his bedroom reading, Brad, I really wanted to give you these gifts in person, but I guess the Pentagon had a different idea. I am so proud of what you do, so I'll just go on missing you. Have a nice weekend at home, baby. I look forward to seeing you soon. Happy Valentine's Day, sir. I love you so very much. Hugs and kisses, Kim. Okay, so now for like my sanity, I have to believe that I am not the only one feeling super sassy at Kim. Like I'm almost secondhand embarrassed telling you guys all of this, but believe it or not, there was yet another reason for Kim to want Steve dead. Or, you know, a rough, casual 450,000 odd reasons in the form of a couple of life insurance policies in Steve's name that had Kim listed as the main beneficiary. Because of course there was life insurance, you guys. And it just so happened that in one of these policies that Kim had seemingly taken out without Steve's knowledge back in November 1996, she had said in the paperwork specifically that Steve was a smoker, which was very strange to the police because everyone they were speaking with during their investigation couldn't get over how bizarre they found it that Steve would have died in this routine smoker's accidental fire when Steve wasn't a smoker. He had never smoked, not even cigars. Like one of Steve's friends told police about this time that he and Steve had been at this fancy work dinner and they had been offered some very nice fine cigars. And when Steve had turned them down, this friend was surprised and had turned to him like, are you sure those are really nice cigars and they're free? But Steve just shrugged and said that he didn't smoke cigars and didn't see the appeal at all. But back to Kim, right? It was becoming abundantly clear to police that she had wanted out of the marriage. And initially she had been gutted that divorce wasn't an option because Steve wanted to stick it out and mend their relationship, God forbid. But it seemed like over the months leading up to the murder, Kim had actually come to terms with this and decided that maybe divorce wasn't the best option for her and Steve anyway. After all, Kim told friends that she was worried that if she and Steve were to get divorced, then Steve might try and get full custody of Anna or try and turn Anna against her. And anyway, Steve didn't really have a whole lot going on in life outside of their marriage anyway. And so he was probably just better off dead. Yeah, Kim made a joke to this friend that maybe if she told Steve about her affair with Brad, then he would get so depressed that he would end his own life and that would solve all of her problems. But then, oh no, this wouldn't work, she went on to say, because if Steve committed suicide, Kim wouldn't be able to claim the life insurance payout. Like, these were all honestly things that were coming out of Kim's mouth in the lead up to the murder. And it seems like originally she was maybe just daydreaming out loud about Steve's death, like as you do. But the more she spoke about it, the more Kim felt that Steve dying was the best option for all those involved. Except Steve, of course, but Kim didn't care about Steve. But things had obviously escalated beyond just daydreaming in December 1997 when Kim had a bizarre conversation with one of her co-workers at the hospital, Kenneth Burgess. Now, Kenneth had worked with Kim for a couple of years. They had both started working at the hospital at the same time, but about 12 years earlier, Kenneth had been convicted for welfare fraud. And apparently, Kim decided that this made Kenneth the perfect candidate to approach and ask to kill her husband for her. Like, Kenneth was just standing there near the lockers minding his own business at work when Kim came up out of nowhere and 
and asked him if he would kill Steve. And Kenneth thought this was a joke at first. Like, I'm sure Kim had complained to him about her marriage and he thought she was maybe just venting about how badly she wanted out. But he quickly realized that Kim was not joking. She was completely serious. And so he said, um, no, I will not kill your husband for you. So Kim asked him if he knew anyone that would be interested because she was willing to pay $50,000 to whoever carried out the hit. When Kenneth said no, again, Kim quickly backed down and told him to forget that they had ever had this little chat and not to tell anyone about it. And this is where things turned really sideways because Kenneth, for some reason, he felt embarrassed about his shocked response to Kim's request to kill her husband. So he made a joke about Kim not needing anyone to kill her husband because she worked in an operating room and could easily just put Steve to sleep. And it seems like this joke from Kenneth was actually a light bulb moment for Kim because from this moment on, Kim wasn't just daydreaming out loud to her friends about how great it would be if Steve died. No, now she was verbalizing the very specific plan she had in mind to murder him. And this brings us to how Kim killed Steve because we know that Steve was either already dead or not breathing by the time the fire started, but there were no fatal injuries that were found during his autopsy, like a bullet wound or a knife wound, no obvious bruising from blunt force trauma or strangulation. I mean, he was burned beyond recognition from kind of like the chest area up, but still there should have been something found. Steve was also a big, strong guy, and so it seemed almost impossible that Kim could have overpowered him in a struggle anyway, especially if he was sober like his alcohol level showed. So the poor pathologist carrying out Steve's postmortem, who had literally just been asked to confirm that Steve had died as a result of a fire, he was understandably confused because this wasn't the case. So he checked Steve's vital organs like his brain, his heart, his liver, and he found no abnormalities or health conditions that would have caused Steve to just randomly die unexpectedly. There was also no presence of drugs in Steve's system other than ordinary amounts of the antidepressant he was on and a normal dose of cold and flu tablets. So this pathologist had started to become extremely suspicious and I don't know how much he knew about what was going on in the investigation or how he became aware of what Kim did as a living, but he eventually turned his attention to drugs found in operating rooms that Kim might have had easy access to and the one that caught his attention was succinylcholine. And he ended up becoming so convinced that this was the drug that had killed Steve that he listed Steve's cause of death as homicide as a result of probable poisoning, even though there was no trace of the drug found in Steve's system. Yeah, I know what is even happening, but it would turn out that this pathologist's hypothesis surrounding succinylcholine would line up 100% with what police would learn from yet another of of Kim's friends regarding a conversation they had just two weeks before the murder, a friend who contacted them literally just hours after hearing about Steve's passing. So on the night of Friday the 30th of January, Kim was making phone call after phone call to one of her friends from college named Rachel. And all of these calls were ringing out and going to Rachel's answering machine because Rachel was out for dinner. So Rachel got home to all of these frantic messages on her machine from Kim saying, call me as soon as you get in, it's urgent. And when Rachel called Kim back, Kim was like, please come over right now. I need to talk to you right away. So Rachel drove over to Kim's and when she got there around 11.30 p.m., she found that Kim was very drunk and absolutely beside herself, saying that she wanted Steve dead and she had a plan where she could kill him without getting caught. Kim told Rachel that she had access to this drug at work that the medical staff used on patients to paralyze them and stop their breathing so that they could insert an intubation tube for assisted breathing. And this drug, which Kim mentioned by name, was called cystinocholine, which is a brand name for succinylcholine. So succinylcholine, which I really hope I'm pronouncing correctly, it's usually administered in a surgical setting and it causes very rapid paralysis of all of the skeletal muscles, meaning you can't 
can't move or breathe. And it takes effect within seconds if it's administered intravenously. And even though if it's administered in a large enough dose, the drug is lethal, at the time it was a non-inventory drug, meaning that Kim could easily swipe it from any operating room in the hospital while she was cleaning up after surgery and no one would notice if it was missing at all. So Kim's plan, as she laid it out to Rachel that night, was that she was going to steal some succinylcholine and inject Steve with enough of it to either kill or sedate him, and then she was going to use a candle or a cigar to set the curtains in their house on fire and make the whole thing look like a terrible accident, you know, a smoker's accident. And this accident would, of course, set her up with a huge life insurance payout that she hoped would allow her to set up a brand new life with her lover Brad and her daughter Anna, who she told Rachel was really better off without her father Steve. Rachel would later testify in court that her response to all of this was to try and poke holes in Kim's plan. Like, I'm assuming she was in a state of shock or maybe she didn't think that Kim was serious. And so one of the holes that she tried to poke in the plan was, well, what if they find the succinylcholine in Steve's system? and it leads police straight to Kim. But Kim knew that the beautiful thing about this drug was that the second it hits the bloodstream, the body immediately starts breaking it down into two component parts that are found naturally within the human body. So literally within just a few minutes, the drug wears off and is completely undetectable, as though it was never there in the first place. And at least back then in 1998, it wouldn't show up in any lab tests at all. So as far as Kim was concerned, she really had planned the perfect murder. Meanwhile, skipping forward back to the investigation, police had decided to try and trace which store the pack of cigars found in Steve and Kim's cottage had been bought from. And after trying about 25 different service stations close by to the Rico family home, they struck gold when they found one selling the same brand Brand of cigars and better yet, the price tags on them were an exact match for the tag on the pack they had from the room. And this is such a strange detail of the case to me, like it's as though fate was already working against Kim because when investigators approached the counter at the service station and showed the attendant a photo of Steve and Kim asking if she recognized either of them, the attendant immediately pointed out Kim and said, yeah, this woman came in and bought a pack of cigars and a six pack of beer. But this was a very busy service station, so it was surprising that this woman would recognize Kim just like that from a photo. But she told the investigators that the day Kim had come in, the day before she and Steve left on their Valentine's Day getaway and bought the cigars, she had complimented Kim on the color of her hair and asked her which salon she had had it colored in. And rather than graciously accepting the compliment like a normal person, she remembered Kim because Kim Kim had gotten all annoyed and huffy, telling her that her hair color was natural, okay? So it was the 23rd of February, like we're talking literally just over a week since the murder, that police brought Kim back into the station to be questioned again, and so that they could confront her with everything they had uncovered, like her inconsistencies in her story, they confronted her about her affair, like they just laid it all out. And Kim's response at first was to act clueless, like she had no idea what they were talking about, but after a bit more pressing, Kim started crying and told the officers that she would tell them everything if she would be allowed to go back home and see her daughter. After this breakdown, though, Kim abruptly changed her mind and instead clammed up and asked for a lawyer. And she was allowed to go and stay with her good friends, Mike and Maureen Miller, while police served search warrants for both her car and the Rico family home. During these searches, police didn't find a whole lot. They did find love letters between Kim and Brad confirming that they had been having an affair and they found this journal that Steve had been keeping. I imagine as part of the marriage counselling or as part of his treatment he had been undergoing for his depression. And it was while reading what Steve had written in this journal that I found my rage at Kim just beginning to boil over. His entries in this journal really just give you this glimpse into what Steve was really like and how much he loved Kim and how hard he was trying to make their marriage work. And 
Honestly, it's heartbreaking. So let's go through some of these entries. In this journal, Steve wrote, life at home is improving and I'm looking forward to Valentine's weekend at Harbour Town with Kim. She called twice today and said, I love you without my saying it first. I was very happy. Kim and I have not made love yet and I want to, but I will wait as long as it takes. I love her. I believe I know what being in love really is. We have been married for nine years, but I feel like we just started dating. Another entry read, I feel she doesn't understand how deeply I love her. I mean real love. I am afraid I won't get the chance to make the marriage right. And finally, just two days before they get away. Last night, Kim came home at about 9.30. She accused me of trying to send her a message because I locked the door and turned out the lights. I locked the door and turned out the lights because I had gone to bed. I want the marriage to succeed, but I won't put up with this treatment. I have a lot to offer someone. This weekend will tell me a lot. At the moment, while these searches of the Rico family home and Kim's car were taking place, Kim was upstairs at Mike and Maureen's house having a bath. And knowing obviously that this would have been a very distressing time for her friend, Maureen went upstairs to check on Kim and she found her kind of drowsy and slurring her words. So freaking out, Maureen looked around the bathroom and saw this empty pill bottle with a label for Xanax on it. And so Kim was rushed to the hospital in fears that she had attempted to take her own life by overdosing. But then her toxicology report came back as negative for any Xanax. Yeah, it looked like Kim had staged the whole thing as a way to, I guess, garner sympathy and avoid what she knew was coming. But her plan failed miserably. And just two days later, she was arrested for first degree murder and first degree arson. And after careful evaluation at a psychiatric hospital, Kim was declared fit to face trial. And when the trial began in January 1999, where Kim, of course, pled not guilty, the prosecution knew that they seriously had their work cut out for them, like it was going to be an uphill battle. The theory that the prosecution were pushing based on the investigation by police was that that night after the murder mystery dinner, Kim had either lured Steve with sex or waited till he was asleep before she injected him with the succinylcholine and then pulled him onto the floor and rushed around staging the scene. We're talking the beer bottles, the champagne bottle, the cigars, the Playboy magazine, all of that. And then Kim had doused Steve's head and upper body with fire accelerant and started the fire. And by this point, I mean, we can only hope that Steve was already dead, but there's no way for us to prove this. But the prosecution were well aware that they had very little physical evidence to present to back up this theory. There had been two syringes found by police during the investigation, one on the golf course at the resort itself and the other one in the Rico family home. But this evidence had been ruled inadmissible by the judge when Kim's lawyer argued that the syringes that were found were irrelevant to the case because there had been no needle marks found on Steve's body during his autopsy. So, you know, obviously, it didn't matter that the top half of Steve's body had been burned beyond all recognition, meaning that any needle box would have been impossible to find. Also, you remember Bear, the good boy that told the fire marshal that there was definitely an accelerant on the floor between the beds? Yeah, Bear's hard work was also deemed inadmissible at trial because it couldn't be backed up by lab testing for chemicals, meaning that the accelerant used, probably lighter fluid, had evaporated and was no longer detectable to us mere humans. And of course, there was also the fact that despite Steve's death being officially listed as homicide by probable poisoning, there had been no poison found in his system. Basically, if investigators were right about the way they thought things had played out, almost all of the evidence had been either metabolized by Steve's body or destroyed in the fire. Like, as much as it does pain me to admit, Kim had seriously come close to committing the perfect murder. Luckily though, as we've learned, Kim hadn't been able to shut up about it. And the jury heard testimony after testimony from no less than six of Kim's friends and co-workers who all spoke about how badly she had wanted out of the marriage, about all of the times they had heard her speak about killing Steve, and in some cases how she had gone into great detail about her plan to murder him. Steve's family members also spoke about how when Kim had come to stay with them after the fire, she had been really very blasé about all of the funeral plans being like, you know, 
I don't mind, whatever you guys want to do. But in contrast, when it came to Steve's body, they were very struck by how concerned Kim had been about the delay with Steve's body being released by the medical examiner's office because she said that she wanted him cremated ASAP probably because she was worried about what they would find, but she said that this was what Steve would have wanted. Kim's lawyers desperately tried to overcome these damning witness statements by saying, and I quote, loose talk and inappropriate conduct before the incident on the part of Kimberly Rico was suspicious, but nothing more, end quote. And they attempted to put forth a theory that Steve could have died unexpectedly because he had become ill from breathing in like pesticides and chemicals used to treat the grass at the golf course that he worked on. But like we said, there were no illnesses or health issues found in Steve's autopsy and all of his organs were in perfect functioning condition. So in the end, after a five-day trial, it took the jury only three hours to deliberate and find Kim guilty on both counts of first-degree murder and first-degree arson. And she was sentenced to life in prison for murder and 30 years in prison for arson, both sentences to be served concurrently. Kim filed an appeal in May 2000 saying that she did not receive a fair trial or effective representation from her lawyers because of the bias in the media that the jury would have been exposed to. And this is actually something that I could potentially agree with because there had been no less than 50 news articles in the local newspapers leading up to the trial regarding the case, 35 of which were right there on the front page. So there was very little chance that any of the jury members hadn't been exposed to the story and already made up their own mind on whether Kim was innocent or not. However, despite all of this coverage in the media, her lawyers had never once asked for a change of venue. Kim also argued that the prosecutors had not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Steve had died as the result of of a criminal act, i.e. Kim poisoning him and then setting a fire to destroy the evidence. But this appeal was ultimately denied, as was her subsequent appeal in 2004. And so to this day, 24 years after Steve's murder, Kim is still incarcerated at the Maryland Correctional Institute for Women. And she's reportedly a model prisoner, even though she has a lot to say about her life in prison. And she's written a handful of articles from behind bars complaining about things like a ribbon being cut out of a Bible that had been sent to her. She's also complained about not being able to read Game of Thrones, allegedly because maps, including the ones in the books of the fictional Westeros, uh, Westeros? Westeros, Westeros, anyway, maps are contraband. And in another article, she complained about new rules regarding contact between visitors and prisoners and said that her granddaughter is being penalized by not being allowed to hug her. And if you're wondering, yes, yes, Kim did fail in her article to touch on the fact that her husband, Steve, is also not able to hug his granddaughter or his daughter because she murdered him. And that's where this case stands as of today. And now now, best friends, it's time to talk about all of our feelings. And I know we've covered a lot of cases recently where at the end of everything, when all is said and done, I feel very conflicted about whether the person actually committed the crime and whether that was proven beyond reasonable doubt. But I'm happy to say for me in this case, there's no question that Kim did this and that it was proven beyond a reasonable doubt in court with all of those witness testimonies. But one thing I did find myself coming back to over and over again was was these friends and co-workers of Kim's that came forward after the murder. Like, on the one hand, I am so glad that they came forward at all. It's so scary to think of how close Kim seemed to getting away with murder without these people's testimonies. And I understand that they probably didn't think that Kim was serious at the time, that she was just venting about how unhappy she was in her marriage. But I don't know, for me personally, it reminded me of a semi-recent event involving two famous actors who each publicly accuse the other of domestic violence and abuse. And I'm sure just saying that a lot of you will immediately know the case I'm talking about without me even saying any names. And I honestly don't want to get too far into it because it is such a loaded case and there's no denying that public opinion leans very heavily in one of the actor's favours. But during a trial in 2020, there were these text messages revealed in court sent by this actor who's got very nearly the whole world on their team saying very specific things about the way he would like 
like to kill the other party, the other actor, and the disgusting things he would like to do to her body afterwards. Like, absolutely horrific stuff. And the receiver of these texts, coincidentally, another famous actor, never came forward. Quite the opposite, actually. He instead joked along and seemed more embarrassed than anything when the texts were read aloud in court. But like tangent alert over her, I guess what I'm wondering is where you guys would draw the line between just the disgruntled rantings of a friend in an unhappy relationship and the point where you would be like, oh, I might need to actually alert someone about this. Because unfortunately, in Steve's case, no one came forward until it was too late. And I don't want to bash on Kim's friends because I'm sure they've already bashed on themselves and dealt with a whole lot of guilt already. And in the end, they did the right thing, even though they would have known that they probably would face a whole lot of backlash from people saying, well, why didn't you come forward earlier? But I would really love to hear your guys' thoughts. Like, I feel like it's very easy for us to sit back and say, well, they should have called the police straight away. But I really want to know if you're being totally honest, if your best friend in the world, your ride or die, came to you talking the way that Kim did about the specific details that they were planning to commit murder, what would it take for you to turn that little voice off in your head saying they're just kidding, they're not serious, they're just pissed off and let someone know? Because honestly, I don't know what I would do. I would probably just assume that they were kidding. And even Kenneth Burgess' response to Kim asking him to kill Steve, I related to that so hard, being like, oh my God, why am I so awkward? I might have overreacted there. They're going to be mad. Quick, make a joke and make everything better. Like that is something I can totally see myself doing in that situation. But even then, if someone did talk to you about murdering someone and you did take it seriously, do you feel like you would have been taken seriously by authorities if you reported it? Thank you so much for spending this time with me and Lily today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you can let us know by giving it a big thumbs up. And if you are still watching me ramble away and you're not already subscribed, then I would just love if you did that. Oh my goodness. So much. Seriously, it would mean the world if you wanted to make this a regular thing and we could sit down all the time and be best friends forever and grow old together and go for like long romantic walks on the beach together. Like that's just where I see this whole thing going. Is there anything you want to add? Just a big smile. They're over there if you want to say bye. <laughs> they all came to see you, didn't they? Oh, okay. Bye. Thank you again so much for spending this time with me and Lily today. We hope you have a magical week and we will be counting down the hours until we see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.